Good morning everybody and welcome to this session on management and leadership part of the, the new ADAPT program but the diploma as far as you're concerned. Um, today's session is going to be on teams and teamwork and indeed hopefully we'll have time to touch on team building uh, as well and possibly why it's so important. But I'd like to start off with really saying that all of us belong to many teams. We, we, we may not necessarily be aware of that, but let's give you some simple examples. Christian Rory's for God is a team. Um, our own churches, our own ministries are teams. Our families are teams. Uh, one, one could even argue that we obviously belong to teams in when we belong to clubs and associations. And even our local community is kind of like a team. But I suppose, you know, and in a moment I'll come to it, we, we need to understand the definition of, of what a team is. Um, and it's my purpose today to take you through some of that thinking and, and then to talk to you about the stages through which teams pass and then particularly to talk to you about the work of a guy called Belbin who in the 60s came up with a very, very useful instrument that helps us understand the different roles that people play in teams. Now teams, of course, are made up of individuals personalities if you like and it's it's really this that we need to bear in mind because personalities are about people's attitudes and values and beliefs and ultimately their behaviors um, but let's start off by saying a team is a group of individuals humans or indeed non-humans who work together to achieve their goal. That's, that's a very broad general definition. It, it, it was better defined by a guy called Professor Lee Thompson uh, of the Cold School of Management in the US when he said a team is a group of people who are, and this for me is an important word, who are independent and interdependent with respect to information resources, knowledge and skills, and who seek to combine their efforts to achieve a common goal. So if we look at that, we see three parts. Two or more people constitutes a team. An interdependency, i.e. they need each other, and they have a shared common goal. Three, that's the three critical elements we need to remember. A group does not necessarily constitute a team. It's a group. And it's a different definition in terms of what a group is to what a team is. Teams normally have members with complementary skills and generate what we call synergy through a coordinated effort which allows each member to maximise their strengths and minimise their weaknesses. Synergy, what a wonderful word it is in, in, in leadership and management. It simply means one plus one equals three. In other words, working together, the output can be far better than the output of a, the individual contributions of the members. Synergy is something that we need to hold on to closely as a concept. You know, team members need to learn how to help one another. They need to help other team members to their true potential and create an environment that allows everyone to, to be, go beyond their limitations. I don't think we in Christian Warriors for God are particularly good at that. 
Um, yes, I, I, I do believe we're a team. We meet the criteria for a team. But I'm not sure how much help and support we give to each other and essentially uh, how we help others to achieve their potential, their goals. You see, while academic research on teams and teamwork has grown consistently uh, and has shown a, a sharp increase over the past 40 years, the societal diffusion of teams and teamwork followed a volatile trend in the 20th century. The concept was introduced originally into business in the late 20th century, which was followed by the popularisation of the concept of what we call constructing teams. Different opinions exist on the efficacy of this particular management fad. Now, I have to confess, as a psychologist, I, I subscribe to the notion of constructing teams. Because I'm conscious that when groups of people come together for the first time, they do go through four very distinct stages. Now, this wasn't my research or my theory. This is what I learned about and observed. Let me talk about those four stages. The first stage is known as the form stage, or sometimes called forming. It's literally when the group of people come together and meet each other. For the first time. I mean it's, it's characterised usually by handshaking, smiling, introducing oneself, asking questions, listening to what other people have to say. It's a very cordial, formal stage in the development of a team. So if we put together a team here in Christian Warriors Got for God, for a specific purpose. You have to recognise there is this kind of formal stage that is the starting point. Form leads on to a stage known as storm. Now storm or storming is in many ways the exact opposite of the forming stage. You see, in the storming stage, people start to jockey for positions in terms of their role in the team. You know, what they want to do, what they want to contribute, uh, try to understand if there's a hierarchy, etc., uh, etc. Et but it can be quite difficult as a leader to manage the storming stage of a group. And quite frankly, my preferred method is to just be very disciplined with people about it. To quote one of Ma Margaret's favourite sayings, there is no I in team. She's right, of course. Now, some see teams as a four-letter word and overused and underuseful. But remember, we've talked about form, storm. Then the third stage comes of norm. Norm or norms, which in, in some respects is another way for another word for culture. It's, it's about the way we do things in this group. It's when people have an understanding of how things happen around here. Um, and, it, and because everybody conforms to those standards, you get a kind of consistency and fluidity in terms of how they work together. So the norm or norming stage is the stage that we need to get to. But to get there, of course, we need to have clear understanding, clear communication about who does what by when. And people need to have the opportunity to ask questions and to clarify and seek answers to 
specific um, questions that, that they may have. Now, the final stage in the constructing teams model is to perform. And perform is essentially the process by which people become both effective and efficient. It's what we strive to do. It is our ultimate goal. By now we are two or more people working together with an interdependency. We need each other. If you don't recognise that, you cannot be part of a team. And we're working for, us for the same goal. Now, as I say, I, I, I kind of support this, this model quite strongly, having seen it work in many, many cases. And indeed, I, I use it as a model when I'm engaged in the process of team building within organisations. I take people through those stages, even though they may know each other. I get them through those stages because they have to pass through them, I believe in order to get to the performance or perform level. Now, as I said, some people see team as a four letter word, which is underused and under useful. Yet others see it as a panacea that realizes the human relationships movement's desire to integrate what the movement perceives as the best for people and for the best for leaders. But still others believe in the effectiveness of teams, but also see them as dangerous because of the potential for exploiting workers or indeed for the potential of teams resisting or worse still, revolting against the goal or what it is you're trying to uh, achieve. In that term, particularly if we think about exploiting people, the, the team's effectiveness can rely on peer pressure and peer surveillance. Now in Christian Warriors for God, I confess that that's what we use. We, we use a, quite a lot of peer surveillance. Margaret and I will talk about how the performance of a particular team is working by watching them. And we would hope that peer pressure, the desire to be part of a successful team, is enough to drive the motivation to keep people working effectively. However, a guy called Hackman, I think he was Joseph Hackman in the late 70s, sees team effectiveness, not only in terms of performance, but a truly effective team will contribute to the personal well-being and adaptive growth of its members. I would personally, wholeheartedly agree with that. And I don't see that as any contradiction to the model of form, storm, norm, perform. Incidentally, I should have maybe mentioned that many years ago, I took that model and worked with it and wrote a paper and I added two more stages. So we had form, storm, norm, perform and I added dorm or dormitory as a stage where I have seen effectively teens going to sleep, teens losing the fire in their belly, teens meeting just for the sake of meeting. I remember some years ago watching John Cleese who was a a good management teacher and a film he made called Meetings, Bloody Meetings. And in it, he was questioned about 
the Monday meeting. What was the purpose? And he said, well, because it's Monday. Yeah, but what's the purpose? Well, it's Monday and we always meet on Mondays. Yeah, but what are, you, what, what are we meeting for? Well, nothing, but it's Monday. That's the dormitory stage. The dorm. And then I went on with my co-author to suggest there was a final stage, which we could call mourn. Mourn or mourning. And that is when a team breaks up and we feel an expense or experience a, a sense of loss at the breaking up. So you'll hear people say, uh, yeah, I remember when I worked with, those were good old days. Yeah, I mean, it is, of course, that we only remember the good. We tend not to, we choose not to remember those things that were not so good. But there is a mourning phase, I believe, that follows the dormitory stage. Now, that's about me and my research into the subject. Let me tell you about a guy called Peter Guy Northhouse. He wrote a book called Leadership Theory and Practice. And he discusses t teams from a leadership perspective. According to the team approach to leadership, a team is a type of organisational group of people that are members. A team is composed of members who are dependent on each other, work towards interchangeable achievements. He uses the word interchangeable achievements and share common attainments. So it's about you win, I win, we win. You see, a team works together as a whole to achieve certain things. If they're not doing that, then they're not a team. A team is, is usually located in a, the same setting as it is normally connected to some kind of organisation, company, community, church. Teams can meet face to face. That would in many ways be the ideal. However, teams can meet virtually. Let's make no mistake about it with the coming of webcams and particularly things like Zoom. We can have team meetings effectively if we choose to have them. If we have the technology that enables us to have them. Such meetings are absolutely critical because the team's communication is significantly important to their actual relationship. Ergo, com communication is frequent and persistent as and as well as are all the meetings. The definition of team as an organisational group is not completely set in stone as organizations have confronted a myriad of new forms of contemporary collaboration teams have need to change teams usually have strong organizational structures and respond quickly and efficiently to challenges so they must have within their teams the capability to do that i'll talk more about that in a moment when I talk to you about the work of Belbin. An effective organisational team leads to greater productivity, more effective implementation of resources, better decision and problem solving, better quality service, greater innovation and originality. These are the, these are the Results, if you like, of what I referred to earlier, a synergy. One plus one is three. Alongside the concept of a team, compare a more structured, skilled concept that is often used today, particularly in the US, of a crew. The advantages of formal 
or informal partnerships, or the well-defined but time-limited existence of task forces. A team becomes more than just a collection of people with a strong sense of mutual commitment. As I said, it creates synergy, thus generating performance greater than the sum of the parts of its individual members. Thus teams of people who are game players can form and reform to continue to practice and improve their craft or their sport. For, for example, if you took something like uh, transport, transport logistics, you can, in order to achieve transport logistics, select a team of horses, donkeys, or even oxen for the purpose of conveying passengers or goods. So we see that teams have three common factors related to them. We've looked at the concept of synergy and we've looked at the model of Fallen Storm Norman perform and I threw in as a little bit of extra the dawn uh, and the morning phase. I'd like to though just go on if I may to talk about Belbin. Now, some of you have heard of him, in fact some of you may already have done his psychometric instrument that he produced. Belbin in the 70s studied the effectiveness of high-performing teams and what he noticed was that there were effectively eight key roles that people play and these roles are inextricably linked to their personalities so in many ways his instrument was a personality profile but let me quickly talk you through those key roles because one of the assignments of this week is going to be related to these roles. Belvin recognised that in a, in a given team there are two kinds of leaders, two types, two different types. He gave them different names. He called the first one a chair and the chair, as the word suggests, is it's a kind of a formal role, a person who organises, plans, gets agendas out, gets minutes completed, makes sure people are communicated with. It's the formal role of a chairman and it's a leadership role in a team. But the, there is a second kind of leader role which is known as the shaper now i don't consider myself a particularly well i know because i've done the psychometric test my scores on being the chair are not that high my scores on being a shaper are phenomenally high see shapers are a different kind of leader shapers as the word might suggest, push, shove, drive, and make things happen. And they're not going to be happy until it does. And once they've achieved it, they'll start push, shoving, and driving towards something else. Now, they don't have necessarily formalized authority, but the strength of their personality can be such that people will do as the shapers want them to do. So there's two leadership roles in, in, in particular. Now there are, there are two roles in the team that are related to innovation, creativity, but they're, they're very, very different. The first is called a plant. And a plant is literally an out-of-the-box 
creative thinker. Somebody who just comes up with what to most people might seem like a weird and wonderful idea. They do not think necessarily using their left side of the brain, which is the rational bit. They tend to use much more their right side of the brain, which is the creative bit. These are the true innovators, the true innovators. The second on the innovation score, oh, sorry, on innovation, is a role known as the resource investigator. Now, if you thought my shaper skills were high, my resource investigating skills are even higher. Resource investigators are not original thinkers. They don't come up with blue sky thinking, as it's often called. Their skill is in seeing something and obtaining access to that resource for the benefit of the team. That's what they do. They steal other people's ideas. And they don't steal them completely, because, I mean, as an author, I know you've got to change at least 10% in order to not affect copyright laws. But they take an idea that somebody else has and says, yeah, if we did it like this, it could work for us. You know, when I was consulting and I would be teaching in a hotel, and there would be other consultants teaching other subjects, you know what I used to do of an evening? <laughs> Sounds a bit naughty, this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I used to go into their rooms and I used to look at their flip charts and the materials that they had been using. And every now and again, I would think, ah, that's good. I can use that to my advantage. That's what in resource investigators do. That's where the title comes from. They investigate resources and see if they're of use to the team. We then move on to a very critical role. Um, Belbin called it team worker. I, didn't, I don't like that. I, I call it the team player. The team player is, is the person in a team who is concerned about the well-being of all the members of the team. These are the people who will make sure rooms are booked and if it's a physical meeting, the coffees are organised. These are the people who will make sure that people remember the meetings coming up and will generally facilitate the cohesion between the group. You know, in Christian world, for God, we've got a couple of good examples of team players. I mean, and I don't wish to embarrass you, but people like Zena, she's a team player. You just see her in meetings. She's not a shaper, she's not pushing and shoving, she's not coming up with lots of original ideas. But she's kind of always there. She's always consistent. Uh, and she kind of holds the, the cement of the group together. The next role um, is, is known as the completer finisher. You see, human beings have a tendency to be good starters and poor finishers. We start off with a but somebody has to do the, the, the finishing because if you don't do the finishing you don't get the task done. Now, I score very low on that. Very low. But I'm blessed because with Susan who does have a high score on completing finishing, she will go over the work that I'm doing and 
complete it and finish it for me. Now that shouldn't be seen as a menial job. She has a talent for it. Margaret has a talent for that. I often draft things and the first person I send them to is Margaret to get her to complete and finish for me. It's a very, very important role. Without it, you're not going to achieve your goals. The last one I want to talk specifically about is the monitor evaluator. Now this is arguably a person who, as the word suggests, monitors and evaluates things. They like data. They like numbers. I like data. I like numbers. I can work with things like that. So I score, it's probably my third preference after being a shaper, resource investigator, and finally a monitor evaluator. Because a monitor evaluator works with hard facts. Hence, you see me putting out notices about how many posts we've put out this month or how many people are in what groups and what percentage of growth are we getting. Hmm. Remember, all these character traits are linked to our personalities. Now, there is, Belvin said, uh, another role um, that needs to be considered, which we call the specialist. But that is a person we bring into a team to do a special job for us. Not a general job, but something very special. If we were to look at Christian Warriors for God, we would see somebody like Dr. Andrew in that role. Because Dr. Andrew, for all intents and purposes, is a theologian. He is the person I turn to as a spiritual advisor for advice and help. But he has a very narrow, focused part to play in the team. When I was a consultant, I would be called into organisations to do a very narrow, focused job. And I'd work in a team. But they're not... <coughs> excuse me, they're not a traditional part of the team. They're an add-on in that sense. Now, we need to recognise that, as I say, we're in different teams. But our tendency is to play the same sort of roles in most teams because they're linked to our personality. They're, li they're linked to who we are. When a new person joins a team, there is an interesting um, situation. Um, you really have to go through the process of form, storm, norm and perform all over again to integrate that person into the team. Some years ago I wrote a, a paper called Apart Together Apart describing what happens when teams are together go apart and come back together again. And what the research showed was that there was a definite need to reinforce the process of bonding. Now, I haven't had much time today because I need to close to talk about team building. Team building takes people through those stages. Remembering that some of those stages, like storming, can be difficult and have to be managed. But that's the process by which you, you, you team build. You know, the ultimate key to team building, if you want to give a team a goal, give them a common enemy. A common enemy. That will get them focused. Okay. Enough about teams. I'm sorry, I've gone just over 35 minutes. Your assignment this week is 
threefold. I'm going to ask you firstly to identify the teams that you think you belong to. Um, secondly, I, I'm going to ask you to describe that process of form, storm, norm, perform. And if you want to be really clever, you can talk about dorm and, and, and more. But finally, I would like to ask each of you to complete the Belbin team inventory and have a look at where your strengths are in, in a team. Because remember, we play to our strengths. Yes, we try to improve our weaknesses. I try to be a better chairman, but I'm not naturally a chair when I'm, when I'm with a team. So three parts. Identify your teams. Um, describe the process we talked of, of forming, storming, norming, performing. And finally, um, to complete the Belbin questionnaire. If you haven't got it, please write to me and I'll email it to you. You can complete it. Don't take time thinking about it. Just complete it and send it back to me. And I'll send you a personalised report on it. OK, that's more than enough for today. <laughs> God bless you all. I wish you good luck with your assignments. And if there's any questions, as always, you know where to come. <laughs> There's no excuse for not taking that action. God bless you all. Have a great day. I intend to. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.